So hi everyone, welcome to the Stanford Algebraic Geometry Seminar. Uh, a few announcements before we start. Please mute yourself unless you have something you wish to say. Uh, but if you're willing, please leave your video on so we can, so we can see each other. Uh, and for those interested, there is a parallel chat in Discord. Uh, but use this only if you feel like it, because some people find it distracting and others find that it helps them concentrate. Uh, so I guess Isabel finds it distracting. I find it helps me concentrate. So one of us will be on Discord. You can guess who. Uh, and uh, the speaker will not be following the chat, the Zoom chat or anything. And the style of the seminar traditionally being that people ask the speaker a lot of questions, including quite elementary ones uh, and even to repeat something. So please, please do so. And don't be shy about it. And the seminar is small enough that if you have a question, please just unmute yourself and ask it out loud. Don't worry about raising hands. Uh, and if you see a question in the discussion that you think should be asked, even if you didn't have that question, just unmute yourself and ask out loud because some people are shy. Okay, so it's great to actually have back, I, I guess, again, Margaret Bilou. Uh, I wish she were back physically, but she, uh, she's coming to us from uh, New York, from the US, France, and Austria uh, in, I guess that chronological order, Courant and IST, uh, uh, past, present, future. And, uh, and so please go ahead, Margaret. Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's great to be uh, back uh, virtually uh, to Stanford. So uh, today I'm going to talk about, this is the first time I'm giving uh, this talk and it's uh, a lot of this is still work in progress, but because we, my, my co-authors uh, and I feel that it's pretty exciting, we uh, already wanna uh, share this with, uh, with people. So uh, before, before I, uh, before to start, I'm just going to give a few um, definitions. So the, the main uh, protagonist uh, is the growth and decreeing of varieties, which, so this is the usual definition for a K field, the growth and decreeing of varieties is uh, the uh, free abelian group on isomorphism classes of varieties over K, uh, where I mod out by the following uh, relations. So whenever X is a variety over K and Z is a closed subscheme of X and U is the open complement of Z and X, I want to be able to cut up X into Z plus U. But in fact, uh, today we're going to use a slightly modified uh, version of that ring. So I'm, calling, I'm gonna call this the modified growth in the ring of varieties, K0 tilde. And so uh, I'm just gonna add a bunch of relations and the relations are the following. I want to identify two classes, X and Y, two varieties X and Y, uh, whenever there is a morphism from X and Y, which is uh, what we call the radicial surjective. And what this means, there are two natural definitions for this. The one that is most useful in our case is this one. So F from X to Y is radicial surjective. If for any algebraically closed extension of little k, the induced map on the big K points is a bijection. So it induces bijections on all, uh, all uh, geometric points. And this is the one that we're gonna use uh, most of the time when proving equalities in the growth and the varieties because it's very, uh, often we have like a very uh, straightforward bijection between geometric points and we're not sure if the underlying morphism is actually a, an isomorphism or a or piecewise isomorphism, but sometimes it's actually not. Um, so that's why this is the most useful one, but uh, often uh, also this definition appears, which says that F is bijective and uh, for every point in X, the extension of residue fields is purely inseparable. So uh, from this definition, we see of course that in characteristic zero, the growth index ring and the modified growth index ring are just the same thing. But in characteristic P, they could be, uh, they could be distinct. So I only define the growth structure on the growth index ring for the moment, but it act it's actually a ring. And well, the product, the definition of the product is uh, pretty straightforward. It's just, I, if I wanna multiply two classes, I just take the class of the product and the unit element is the class of the point. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, is, is there, an, is there an, an, an example in characteristic P of, of, of two varieties where, where it would not be 
at least maybe not a proof, but at least two varieties where it's not clear that where where it's where it looks like that this extra relation is doing something. So actually, I don't. So I don't. Um, uh, so I don't think uh, that there is a known um, example of uh, like two things uh, that mm -hmm. we know have. Uh, uh, the same class in uh, the growth in the modified growth in the ring and not the same class in the uh, growth in the ring, as far as I know. Okay, is there is there a candidate? Um, well, already uh, I, I don't know. Like uh, j just to take just like over k, just take in, like an inseparable extension of uh, if if you have a, 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 a like a, a non perfect field, you take an inseparable extension. Extension, it's not. Uh, it's not clear uh, if uh, just this the, this class um, is uh, is equal to just the class of the point or not. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, sorry, yeah? are there distinction between the uh, chronic ring and the modified chronic ring for finite fields or even perfect fields? Uh, yeah, then for finite fields, it's already different. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. But is the a polynomial generated by L the same? Like sorry, there's, sorry? A, there's a sub ring of the ground degree generated by L, right? Uh, yeah. The adjoining L, so they are they are the same, right? Um. Or are there additional relations? Um, the adjoint uh, adjoint L minus one. Uh, no, I, I mean uh, the adjoining L. Does that yeah. embed into the uh, both ground rings? Uh, oh uh, uh, yes, sure. I'm, uh, I mean, embed. I mean, it's. I mean, L is a zero divisor, but uh, I mean, there's a morphism, but then uh, it's. Uh, Z. Yeah. Z join L would just be a free polynomial ring. Yeah. L, L yeah. Just Z join L. It is a free polynomial ring, but inside, like, yeah. I mean, L. Yeah, L is not nilpotent. If the, if this is the question. I, I know that L is important. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, L is not. Okay, I'm, yeah, I don't know if I answered important. your question. <laughs> um, no, you did, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so the element L, uh, which we just talked about, is the class of the affine line. And so, uh, for example, uh, if you want to compute the, uh, the class of the uh, projective space, then you just cut it up into its affine charts and I mean, in, in one affine chart and the complement and you, uh, do this again, and then uh, you get this uh, funny looking geometric sum. And often we like to uh, localize at uh, L, which uh, this actually uh, does kill some elements. Like the L is known, at least over uh, in characteristic uh, zero, it's known that L is a zero divisor. So uh, this, is a, this is a non trivial operation. Um, and on this localized ring, oh, sorry, I forgot the twiddle here. Um, and there's a topology also on the growth in the ring, which is just generated, but which, which is just induced by the dimension of varieties. So uh, I take the D step of the, uh, of the filtration to be the subgroup generated by things of this form. So um, a class of a variety uh, time, uh, times L to the minus N, where the dimension of the variety X minus N is at most D. So this gives me an increasing and exhaustive filtration on M tilde K, and I can take the completion, which will be denoted uh, this way. Okay, so now there is, in the case when K is a finite field, there is something I can do on the growth and decreeing of varieties, or even the modified growth and decreeing of varieties, I can count points. So I can just uh, send a variety to its number of points over FQ. And this is a uh, 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 ring morphism. And when once we have this, uh, there are a lot of, um, if, if I have uh, some, some result in number theory that involves point counts of varieties, there is a quite a natural way of, uh, via the counting measure to kind of lift it to the Grothendieck ring of varieties. And so this whole talk is essentially about how uh, is such a result over, uh, by point count related to the corresponding lift. So this is, this is the, the point of this talk. 
So to give you an example of how we actually lift things, and uh, also because we will need this object, I will introduce uh, Kapranov's data function. So you all know the data function of a variety over FQ. It has, uh, there are a bunch of formulas that uh, you can write down for it, but. I mean, they yeah. may not know, they may not know, but you're about to explain it right now, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, so the data function of a variety over FQ, there are, there are different formulas that you can write down for it. The, the ones that are relevant for this talk are these two ones. So first of all, it's, um, well, up to, up, to logarithmic deriva up to logarithmic derivative, it's the generating function of the point counts of X overall, uh, ex uh, overall extensions, uh, or all finite extensions of FQ. And it is also the generating function of the number of effective zero cycles uh, on X of degree N. Um, sorry for one more interruption. Is the uh, yeah. counting matter not defined on the user ground degree? Oh, it is, it is, it is. Ah, so the, I see. But then I guess uh, we're just focusing on the modified, right? Yeah, yeah, just that in, uh, in the case where K is uh, FQ for me, I, I, oh, everything I'm going to be talking about, you need to consider the modified group in the ring. I see. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so this is the usual data function of, of a variety over a finite field. And then there is its motivic lift and here, uh, you notice that once I've lifted things to, to the Grothendieck ring, I actually can forget that my field was originally finite and I can define things even for a field that's not finite. So here K is any field and I take a quasi-projective variety over K. And the Kapranov's data function over K so is just the generating function of the classes of the symmetric powers of X. Okay, so the symmetric power of X is just, I take X to the N and I quotient by, take the quotient by the permutation action on the coordinates. So this gives me a series, which is with coefficients in the modified uh, growth in the ring and it is, it, uh, when the field is finite, then it specializes to the usual uh, data function. Right. And so just a few examples so that you see how it looks like. So uh, the Kapranov data function of uh, the fine space of dimension N is just, is very simple, just one over one minus L to the NT. And uh, the Kapranov data function, if you, if you, if you, if you cut up a variety, you have to multiply uh, the corresponding data functions. So that's why the Caprano data function of Pn is this thing. But in general, uh, the, what you we need to understand is that, uh, what you need to know is that the Caprano data function most of the time is is not rational. So it's like rational only for essentially for rational things and maybe a few others. Okay, so these are the examples. And so now I'm going to come to how do you um, lift theorems via the counting measure. So let's go. So the type of theorems that I decide uh, that I uh, will be talking about are what I call Bertini type theorems. Uh, why is that? Well, because, so the, the, the general context is the following. I take X, a variety, a smooth projective variety inside some projective space in dimension N, and I consider inside the space of all uh, degree D polynomials and n plus one variables, I consider those that cut out hypersurfaces that intersect X transversely. Okay, so it's this kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's this, uh, oh, it's an open subset inside this, uh, inside this, which is a, just a vector space. And so there are two the theorems I wanna quote about this. So there's, uh, theorem by Poonen, which is called uh, in the literature and everywhere, the Bertini theorem over a finite field. So it's, it's uh, I, I here I assume that the base field is finite. And this is about the point counts. So the number of hypersurfaces, the proportion of hypersurfaces that intersect X transversely inside the, all of the hypersurfaces, 
as v goes to infinity, has a limit. And this limit is this nice special value of uh, the data function of the variety x. And the corresponding motivic lift is this theorem by Ravi uh, and Melanie Wood, uh, which is the says the following. If I now take the motivic proportion, so the class UD in the Grothendieck ring, in the modified Grothendieck ring, divided by just the total space of all polynomials, which I uh, note here that this is a vector space, so it's uh, so this is invertible in the localized growth in the ring, so I can I can divide by this, and this has a limit in the dimensional topology, and this limit now is Kapranov's data function. is given in terms of Kapranov's data function, so these theorems look very much alike, and at first sight it looks like you can just if you um, if you take this theorem and you specialize it, you should just obtain that theorem. But this is actually not the case. So the, the problem is that the counting measure that we saw uh, earlier is badly non-continuous with respect to the dimensional filtration. So whenever you have uh, a motivic result that involves some conversions for the dimensional filtration, it, it won't specialize. So, uh, so the question now is how to compare these results. So in fact, these results are not really comparable just uh, the one, uh, to each other. None of them applies to the other. And the, the, the methods of, of proof are unrelated, except on the very superficial level that uh, both use some kind of uh, um, type of inclusion exclusion. But well, in, ca in the case of Kuhn's theorem, it's, it's actually a sieving process. In, in uh, the case of Wackett and Woods, uh, theorem, it's some kind of motivic inclusion exclusion principle, and it's not clear at all how you would kind of uh, even use uh, 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 find a unified proof of these two statements. So, our uh, uh, so my aim in this talk is to give you uh, some way of uh, viewing these two results as conjecture uh, as consequences of some uh, conjectural theorem. So what is the, what is, uh, the uh, slogan going to be? Slogan is going to be that we should pass to data functions. Why is that? So if we look at these two theorems, then, so let's start with, let's start with Poonen's theorem. So Poonen's theorem is a result about point counts, but well, it's a result about point counts over FQ, but we can very well apply it over all extensions of FQ, right? So actually, it's a it's a bunch of theorems about about uh, the point counts of these spaces over all finite extensions over FQ. But you remember from uh, the formula for the data function that I wrote down earlier that the point counts over successive uh, extensions over FQ they are just the coefficients up to logarithmic derivative of the data function. So it looks like Poonen's theorem could be viewed as a convergence result for data functions of, of for data function of this thing in the coefficient topology, the, the topology where a power series is small if its coefficients are small. Okay, so that's how you sh we should think about Poonen's theorem. Maybe, and now, actually, yeah. uh, Margaret, maybe I think this will become clear fairly soon, but. It's, they, since they are already about zeta functions, you mean was it, you mean zeta functions in your sense that this is the the, the richest? You have to say like what you mean by zeta functions and what. The yeah, point. I will say. Oh, oh yeah, I will. I will say. I will say it here. But it's it's like zeta bona fide zeta fun, like the zeta functions uh, of over zeta function of a variety over a finite field. Right. It's it's those. But there, there will be a bunch of zeta functions. That, so it's it's a very zeta zeta function -y talk. Uh, it's about, yeah. Um, okay. So let's now think about Vakilin Wood. So Vakilin Wood is a theorem in the dimensional topology. And if we think about what dimension controls uh, in terms of uh, in, in data functions, well, by the veil conjectures, the dimension um, of, uh, of a variety uh, is related to uh, how to the size of the poles and the zeros of the data function of that, uh, of, uh, that variety. So 
This means that uh, when um, when a variety uh, becomes like small in dimension, this actually means that it becomes small in the pole and zero topology, where a function is small if it doesn't have any poles or zeros in a large ball around like a large ball around one. Um, so, so this is kind of the 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 two uh, the point of view to keep in mind on these two theorems. So let's uh, see how we can actually implement this. So we are going to apply the following motivic measure. So when I say motivic measure, I just mean a ring morphism from the Grothendieck ring of varieties into some other ring. This is uh, this is what the motivic measure is. And so here, my motivic measure is what I will call the data measure. The data measure is just I associate it. I associate to a variety its data function. And when I mean data function, I mean the the, the, the classical data function of x over a variety of q. And what is the ring? Well, uh, it's as a set. It's just the uh, the complex rational functions which take the value one and zero. Okay, so I, of course, now have to explain a lot of things. I have to explain, first of all, why this thing is a ring. So the ring structure is the following. So it's, it's kind of, it's the wit ring structure. If you've heard about, uh, about, wit, about the wit ring construction, if, you, if not, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. Um, so the sum, uh, so that's why I, I just, I say wit ring just because I, I put a little W here. So this the W stands for width. Um, so F plus G in this ring is just the usual product of rational functions. And now uh, there are several ways of defining the product. One way, uh, the way that uh, I find easiest Margaret, here is just to, yes? In your motivic measure, is, is K a finite field here? Zeta? Um, so for the moment, uh, 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 so, uh, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have, yes. I should have, I should have said this. Of course, of course, we can only uh, compare uh, uh, Rabi and Melanie's theorem to uh, Bjorn's theorem uh, if we are over finite field. If, if, if in both cases we are over finite field. So yes, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. But uh, like starting now, I will mostly uh, be in the finite field case. Okay. So uh, yeah, and so the product, I will just define it. Uh, so if I want to take the product of two things, I actually first uh, factorize them into linear factors. And uh, the, the product of one minus one over one minus AT and one over one minus BT, I just multiply the two coefficients together. I think you need to scroll up a little bit. Sorry? I think you need to scroll up a little bit. Um, it's, I'm here. Um, okay. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, and so another way of viewing this uh, is by uh, is via the following. So the following thing is going to be a ring isomorphism. So I can I have a ring isomorphism between my my ring R one of rational functions with value one at zero, and the uh, the group ring of C star of just the non-zero complex numbers. In the following way, I just send a rational function, which I can always write like this, um, to it's kind of its divisor. It's a little bit uh, more complicated than its divisor. It's actually minus the divisor of F T inverse because of the way we've uh, normalized things, which uh, is for uh, technical reasons. But essentially, uh, you, if, you, if you associate the function to its uh, twisted kind of divisor, uh, then uh, the multiplication here corresponds to just the usual multiplication in this, uh, in this group ring. So that's why like A times B here is just AB. Okay, so that's the that's the ring structure, and now uh, I will introduce different topologies on the ring, and I I will explain how these are related and how they are related to the results that I've just explained into the conjecture that I'm going to state. So the, the topologies. So there's the first one which I told uh, told you about already earlier is the coefficient topology. So what's the coefficient topology? I just when I take the uh, rational functions and I just take their power series expansion at zero, then well, I end up in uh, in this uh, in this thing here, which is actually also a ring with the the like the 
the ring structure that I described earlier, it, it, it is actually um, kind of the restriction of the, rich, the, the ring structure on this thing, which is what, what is called the width ring. If, you, if you've heard about it, if not, it's not a big deal and you don't really, we don't really need to multiply things in this, in this thing, in this talk that much. Um, and well, the point this, the, the topology here is just, well, I just consider this as uh, all of its coefficients uh, with the product topology. And an alternative way of viewing this is by also apply, applying the logarithmic derivative. So I, I don't stop here, I go one step further and I apply the logarithmic derivative and I end up in this thing. So just power series with no constant coefficient. And this again, I consider it with the uh, product topology. And it, it, it so happens that this is actually an isomorphism to topological rings. So the topology, uh, the coefficient topology on the power series expansion will be the same as the coefficient topology on the D log of the power, uh, power series expansion. So that's why I said when I said earlier that up to logarithmic derivative, it's going to be uh, convergence in the coefficient topology. Yeah, the logarithmic derivative doesn't really hurt um, the, the convergence. Um, yeah, and so, and the other thing that uh, we can notice because of this is that if you, well, if you just take the power series expansion of the logarithmic derivative, you realize that the, the coefficients in here, which are called uh, in the, this switch ring uh, formalism, and I call the ghost coordinates, um, they will be given by these expressions for uh, J, for uh, growing for all J, uh, at least one. And so the coefficient topology is just induced by the family of semi-norms that uh, like measure these things, measure the size of these things. So this is uh, another way of uh, understanding the coefficient topology. Okay, so this is the coefficient topology. And now we also have the weight topology, which is uh, the one I said about where a function is small if it doesn't have any zeros and poles in a large, uh, in a large disk. And well, so the, the way it's induced is just, I, uh, I take the uh, kind of the, the soup of the absolute values of the zeros and poles that occur. So this is, this is pretty easy to define. And so now I have these two topologies, the coefficient topology and the weight topology. And the point is that now I'm going to introduce a third topology that will uh, refine both of these topologies. And that is pretty natural, that comes in pretty naturally. Because if we, if, uh, yeah, I'll say, it, I'll say that later. So the, the, this mysterious topology, uh, we've called it the Hadamar topology, which is induced by the following norm. It's induced by the norm that uh, the sum uh, over the, of the absolute value of K, absolute value of A. So, What's the difference with the weight topology? In the weight topology, you only bother with uh, checking that uh, a function uh, doesn't have poles or zeros in some in some disk, and you you don't worry about what's outside that disk. And that uh, inside that disk, you could have like some poles and zeros with huge multiplicities. Whereas here, you also control the multiplicities. So uh, your function is small if it doesn't have any zeros and poles close to zero, and then far from zero. It, it can have zero surpose, but their multiplicities are bounded but somehow. So this is the Hadamard topology. And yeah, so what I announced is that the Hadamard topology will refine both the coefficient and the weight topology. And well, to see this, you just have to kind of look at these semi-norms and at this norm and see that uh, uh, this, is, uh, this gives a finer topology. Okay, so now this Hadamard topology, I want to I want to make uh, things converge in that topology, and for this I need to understand what the, what the completion of so, yeah. So Margaret, I, I, you call it a proposition, but I feel like something big just happened. Like, like this is like a very uh, this is very um, this, the the definition of this topology seems yeah yeah no the definition very, is very, uh, is big, but I think uh, yeah, the proposition itself uh, I guess once I you've come hard. up with the uh, once yeah. you've come up with a topology, it's not that hard, but uh, yeah. yeah. The, line, uh, the, line, the line before maybe is where something big happened. Had a more yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah, definitely this definition, this is, this is something big, I think, yeah. 
I have no idea why it's called Hadamard because I not long forgot what Hadamard. Yeah, well, I, I guess the, the, the okay. answer is on okay. the answer is on the second uh, the next slide actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So well, so I uh, I was saying that uh, we ha we need to understand what uh, if I take this uh, ring of rational functions and uh, I consider the Hadamard topology on this ring. What what the completion with respect to that topology? If I want to make things converge, this is kind of a useful thing to know. And so the proposition, and here maybe there's a big thing happening as well, even though the, like the, the proof of the proposition is, again, not very hard, but it's, uh, there's, I guess this, is, this motivates all, all, everything. Uh, the completion of R1 of our ring of rational functions for the Hadamard topology, uh, we can, which, so if you think about what the completion should be, it should be kind of all of these uh, divisors, this discreetly supported divisors, such that this sum is finite. Uh, but so the, the point is that because of the Hadamard factorization theorem for genus zero functions, it's actually going to be naturally canonically identified just by sending uh, functions to its to it divisor again to uh, the ring of uh, what we call the ring of Hadamard functions. So the ring of uh, quotients of entire functions of uh, genus zero uh, with, uh, w w which take the value zero at one. So yeah, and so I guess this is also why the topology is called the Hadamard topology. What's the Hadamard factorization theorem? It's uh, this thing that says if uh, that if uh, and then uh, if you have um, an entire function of uh, genus zero zero, then you can write it as like a product, an infinite product of uh, linear factors. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, I guess the condition is exactly something uh, something like this that this is finite. <laughs> That's some 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 uh, some sum of uh, like the zeros and poles uh, with multiplicities converges. Uh, yeah. What is the genus of a function? Genus zero. Um, it's a, it's some, I mean, uh, essentially genus zero fun, uh, entire functions are the, are the, the most, the simplest entire function. When you have an entire function, uh, then, uh, it's, it, it's like, it's, it, 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 usually it will be like an exponential of something times, uh, like a product of, uh, like linear factors, uh, and you have to, but the product of the linear factors usually, uh, won't uh, converge. So you need to add some extra factors to make it converge. And the genus zero are those where you don't need the extra factors. So like you have your entire function that has like poles and zeros, then you would like it to be like just the product of the linear factors that make these poles and zeros appear. Uh, but this product, uh, it might not converge. And the entire uh, function are those for, this, for which it does converge. And so the entire function is actually equal to the product. I hope this is clear. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. No, yeah, okay. Um, okay, and so once we have this, our um, meta conjecture, which uh, I mean, it's really, it really has to be taken as just a, a wishful uh, thinking question, um, is that if we, if we have some, um, in some sense, natural sequence of classes in the modified Grothendieck ring, natural and says that it occurs in some natural uh, counting problem or uh, geometric problem or whatever. Uh, and such that the um, corresponding sequence of data functions, which are, will be elements in, us, in our, our ring R1, if it converges in both the coefficient topology and the weight topology, we kind of hope that uh, this is not, this cannot occur by chance, that if this occurs, this means that it actually also it, it already converges in the Hadamard topology. So this is our uh, meta conjecture that we try to kind of uh, ap yeah, apply to different situations and prove in um, different uh, cases. Okay, and so uh, my, my aim now is, is to try to, uh, just to state the, this conjecture in the case of these Bertini theorems that I, um, that I stated earlier. And for this, the only thing that we are missing right now is that if you remember, well, uh, well, these Bertini theorems, it is about, uh, it, we, have, we have our um, natural sequence of classes that uh, converges both in the coefficient and the weight topology, as I explained earlier, the coefficient being from, coming from Poonin's theorem and the weight topology coming from, uh, from Ravi and Melanie's theorem. 
And the only question is, what it, does it converge to? Because you remember that the limits in both cases are these uh, special values of uh, data functions. So the data function of a variety in one case and data function of uh, the Caprano data function in the other case. So it's not very clear for the moment what the, what the limit should be, what this mysterious uh, function in the, in the Hadamard ring should be. And uh, this is kind of the, the, the complicated thing in here is that you end up having to um, compute a data, a data function of a data function and it's gonna be evaluated at a data function. So this is what I uh, need to explain to be able to state my theorem. So to ha not have too many data, so let me start with uh, just uh, some motivic measure, which eventually will be the data mirror. So just a ring morphism from the Grothendieck ring to R. And so R should be some topological ring. And uh, the, uh, the notation in, in uh, this talk uh, most of the time will be that the image of A uh, through phi will be always denoted with a subscript phi. And so, uh, well, Kapranov's, I can specialize Kapranov's data function along phi. Okay, so we'll just get, well, the generating function, but of, of the classes um, uh, via the measure phi. Um, and so this will be, give me um, a function in, uh, with coefficients in R. And so, for example, if I do this with, where, with where phi is my data measure, then, uh, and the data measure with values in R1 with the Hadamard topology, then my Kapranov data function along data is a Kapranov data function whose um, coefficients are the data functions, but the regular usual data functions of the symmetric powers of X. Okay, so here, that's why I also have two variables here because there's a T and there is a, an S. Um, and so uh, my claim here, which uh, I don't really have time to explain that too much uh, is that it can be, it, I can, in the same way as the Kapranov's data function uh, from, uh, from uh, Bakken and Wood's theorem and uh, the usual data function from Paulin's theorem uh, were evaluated at, at uh, like uh, what L, L or Q respectively at the power minus dimension of X minus one, I can evaluate it at the, um, the image of L via the data measure, which is the data function of L to the minus dimension of X minus one of T, meaning that it's just this uh, series. So if I evaluate this thing at S equals this, I will end up just with uh, some Hadamard function. So uh, some, some Hadamard function, and, um, and this is supposed to be my, my limit. So let me just explain uh, quickly how we actually managed to, uh, to evaluate this. So the point is that even though I told you earlier that Kapranov's data function, when, uh, when it's just the usual Kapranov's data function with coefficients in the Grothendieck ring, um, is not rational, but if I specialize it via the data measure, then it actually is rational. So this is uh, an argument that uh, uses the uh, the lambda ring structure on uh, on the Grothendieck ring and on R1. So uh, if you know what the lambda ring is, then well, it's it's the thing that's uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, the lambda lambda ring structure on the Grothendieck ring is essentially given by the Kapranov data function. Would, would you, but I don't I don't have time to go into the lambda ring stuff. Uh, so it's just okay. it's just kind of saying that um, uh, the would you mind just this repeating, thing, uh, just re maybe just like going back in time about one minute and just repeating that again, even if you're not going to go into it? Just say okay, sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so my, my point is that even though uh, Kapranov's data function, uh, the usual Kapranov's data function is almost never rational as a, as a, as a power series, it's, not, it's never rational, um, it's, uh, its specialization via the data measure actually is all, of, uh, all the time. And so this is 
this is an argument using the lambda ring structures on uh, both of these rings, which I don't have time to go into. But the point is that uh, how do I, uh, what, what, what does it look like, this, uh, this rational function? Well, I just take the usual data function of x, which it is, uh, it is rational. I know it's zeros and poles. And it's, and it's zeros, uh, and it's zeros and poles uh, kind of give me uh, uh, the, the zeros and poles of this thing are just going to be given in, in terms of the zeros and poles of, uh, of, the, um, of the data function of x. Can you say again what the subscript fee means in the Caprano it just data means uh, it, ju it just means specialized via fee, specialized through fee. Just means fee, what does that mean? fee of, it just means fee of uh, that applied fee. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so the thing is that we kind of, we know that this, uh, this thing is rational. We know what its poles and zeros are. And so we know that, and so, and we know that th this thing is not a pole and uh, not an or zero. And so we can evaluate this and we get something, uh, we get something. And, it, and we know that it converges because it's rational. Um, and so if we go back to Bertini, then our conjecture in its final form is that if X is a smooth projective variety in Pn, as I, I recall the context, and UD, your member, is this space of uh, hypersurfaces in, intersecting X transversely, or more precisely, polynomials defining hypersurfaces intersecting X transversely, then uh, the conjecture is that in the Hadamard topology, the data function of UD, so you remember that in the, in the statements of Pudens and Wackel and Woods theorems, you were you had to divide by uh, the the total space of sections, but the total space of sections uh, is just an affine space, and so we actually because it's it, what what this is is division in the in the in the Hadamard ring, and so this actually just becomes this uh, renormalization here, just by when you uh, think about what division in the uh, in the Hadamard ring is that that's what it does. So the limit, this thing here, should have a limit in the Hadamard topology, and this limit should be equal to this uh, data function with coefficients in data functions and evaluated at this data function. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is our conjecture. Uh, for the moment, uh, we know how to prove it uh, for a curve, for x a curve, um, and. Uh, well, the other, so we're, of course, we're, we're, um, we're thinking about it. Uh, there's uh, like one, one uh, direction that uh, seems to show that it's a hard problem is that uh, this is uh, pretty related to uh, showing, um, uh, to, to showing uh, representation uh, stability for these spaces. And uh, so in, uh, there's presentation stability in the uh, in sense of Ellenberg, uh, 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 Farb, uh, Church, Ellenberg, Farb, etc. And uh, also uh, controlling um, unstable cohomology because the, the, we have to control these multiplicities of data functions, uh, uh, multiplicity of poles of data functions. And these are related to, well to, to the dimensions of the uh, cohomology uh, rings and dimensions of so we need to control uh, dimensions of cohomology rings and so this is uh, some of them are controlled via the representation stability and some of them need to be controlled via um, via uh, con just controlling unstable cohomology and, and this this is this so uh, like uh, Ellenberg and Farb and uh, their co-authors, they, they know how to do this in some cases but most of the time uh, this uh, unstable cohomology is uh, is a series uh, is a serious obstacle to uh, to actually proving this kind of statement. Um, and maybe a, a, uh, one question: When you say curves, presumably your, your conjecture is also for complete intersections, I guess. And so you know that for curves that are complete intersections too. Um, uh, yeah, yes, yes. I think I think they, we yeah, we don't we don't we don't use uh, anything about uh, except that it's like, like we use uh, the the Abel Jacobi map. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, so that's, that's, uh, that's where we are uh, for, yeah, for this, uh, for this theorem. And um, I guess one direction that we're going into as well is that uh, where we would, we, there is a generalization of the, of this Bertini theorem with more general Taylor conditions. 
uh, that well that is uh, so well in in a final field case it's also in uh, in uh, Bjorn's paper and in uh, in the motivic case it's it's due to uh, Sean and myself um, and but there actually the obstacle is already just stating the conjecture because when well we understand uh, I guess what what the left hand side should be but we don't even we cannot even write down what what the limit should be because we don't even know if like how it's hard to check how Hadamard convergence so we don't even know if uh, like uh, the thing on the right hand side even converges we cannot just do this evaluation thing so yeah so it's it's pretty hard <laughs> yeah so that's that's uh, all I wanted to say about the Bertini uh, theorems and so in the, in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, part of the talk I'm just going to talk about uh, uh, a type of problem where we actually managed uh, to prove Hadamard convergence and in a pretty surprising manner. Uh, so the topic is pattern avoiding zero cycles. So what's the motivation for number theory? Uh, in number theory, you can say that uh, a bunch of like m integers are relatively n prime if they're not all divisible by some nth power. And it's a, uh, I think it's kind of a fol fol folklore theorem that the proportion of relatively n prime m tuples inside, inside all m tuples exists, the, the limit of this proportion exists and is expressed in terms of uh, this special value again of a zeta function. Of, here's just the Riemann zeta function. Uh, and in particular, it depends only on the product mn. So you have uh, also a bunch of coincidences if like you have uh, different uh, things like this where with with uh, different m's and n's that such as mn is constant then you should get the same limit and so the uh, there are also things like this in um, um, over like over F, like for polynomials over fq well there's there's a bunch of uh, literature on the subject but what what we are interested in are is the following context so we're going to take uh like okay, a field here we go back to just considering any, any field, not only finite fields. We take X a quasi-predictive variety over K. And for an any for any tuple of uh, M um, of M integers, of M non-negative integers, we can consider just the sim dx, which is going to be the product of the of the uh, symmetric powers uh, with respect to the different DIs. And we're going to consider the following variety, X and D. It's the locus of um so a point in here you can you can in a geometric point in here you can view it as a like m tuple of of uh, zero cycles and i'm going to consider the locus of these m tuples of zero cycles such that every point of x doesn't have multiplicity at least n in all of the in all of the zero cycles so this is the this this geometric version of uh, being a relatively n prime. I don't want any point that has multiplicity n in all uh, in all uh, in in all uh, uh, coordinates. So the the like the basic example is if I just have one coordinate and I don't allow multiplicity at least two, then this is just the configuration space of d points on X. So just d distinct points in X. Okay, so this is the context. And so natural, natural question, whatever that means, what is the density of this space X and D inside the space that it contains, sim DX? Um, so there's, there's one um, result that I wanna state about, uh, in, this, in this direction, it's due to uh, far both and wood. Um, and so, this is a convergence result about uh, on uh, hodge delin polynomials of uh, a connected smooth complex variety. So here we're, we have k equals c. So they had the idea of uh, interpreting this density as a, some kind of cohomological density where we divide the, the hodge delin polynomial of x and d by the, the hodge delin polynomial of sim d. And they proved that this limit exists in the addict topology of the ring where these Hodgelian polynomials live. And that it, well, it depends only, again, it depends only on a bunch of, uh, of stuff, namely just the product MN, the mixed hodge structure on the cohomology and the dimension of X. So not a lot of things in particular, again, we have a lot of coincidences. 
and well, I, I must say that this is just one of the many theorems in, in this paper. And uh, yeah, they have a lot of topological results that, uh, that, that, are, uh, that are even much stronger than this, but this is what uh, I'm focusing on right now. And just after stating this theorem, they are asking, is there a mutatic lift in some sense of this statement? So one problem if talking about the motivic lift of this is that if we wanted to consider this problem in the Grothendieck ring of varieties right away, then, uh, well, the, this usually, the class of this usually is not invertible in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. So we have at least to uh, consider this problem um, along some motivic measure where, where this be becomes invertible. So a motivic lift would be some, uh, some uh, um, theorem that would hold whatever the motivic measure where this invertible with this is invertible, um, uh, is it that I apply to it? So, so let me let me uh, let me give you the the condition right away. So let uh, so I, here I, again I I start with a pretty um, uh, I, I start with any uh, motivic measure such that that has values in the topological ring. And here, so I will want to uh, be able to specialize at uh, powers of uh, uh, negative powers of L. So, uh, so I, I want a topological ring with a norm such that the L, L inverse along phi is has norm with, uh, small n one. So this so that they can specialize at powers of uh, sufficiently large powers of this of this guy. Okay. So in particular. Uh, Actually, the, yeah. I think Padma has a question. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I was just, I didn't want to interrupt it, but, uh, interrupt you. You'd already started on uh, the other topic, but I was wondering if this Hadamard convergence you stated is supposed to imply uh, the Poonin result and the Wacky Wood results. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if but this uh, if this wasn't clear. Uh, the idea is that yeah. It, that uh, but that the Hadamard topology refines uh, both topologies. So yeah, so it's, it's it would be it would be like the the common generalization of these of these two results that are not that you cannot compare uh, one to the other. Okay, yeah. So yeah. So I had this uh, motivic uh, measure. And um, so I just want, I, so this is just a uh, kind of a technical uh, assumption that I need for, for the proof to work. So uh, I say that a quasi-projective irreducible variety X is weakly rational with respect to my motivic measure phi if this power series, so the data function, um, uh, specialized at, uh, sorry, here it is supposed to be, this is supposed to be Kapranov's data function. If I mess up my data functions, it's not going to be great. Yeah. So Kapranov's data function multiplied by this factor and just the inverse of uh, Kapranov's data function should converge absolutely at L to the minus the dimension. So this essentially just means that I, I don't want X to be actually rational. But I want at least to control the first pole of uh, the data function, and uh, I want to make like I want to make sure that the first pole is actually this, and that uh, there is some uh, leg room uh, beyond that uh, beyond that uh, first pole. So yeah, so this is the the assumption, and uh, so it's this implies uh, mot uh, motivic stabilization of symmetric powers as uh, as defined in. Uh, in uh, Ravi's and Melanie's paper uh, on discriminants in the Grothendieck ring. And in particular, it also implies that the symmetric, all symmetric powers are invertible for these sufficiently large. So are uh, with, when specializing uh, to five. So our problem will make sense in this context. So the theorem is that if I take now X and a reducible quasi-projective variety over K, and here K again is any field, and if it's uh, weakly rational in the previous sense with respect to some motivic uh, measure as above, then the motivic proportion of these 
uh, sorry, that was a, that was supposed to be an X. Sorry, because I changed notations because then uh, uh, these spaces are usually denoted with a Z, but if I figured that if I denoted them with a Z, that would make really too many Zs <laughs> in this talk. Um, so it's uh, the space is X and D, uh, the proportion, the motivic probability in sim D uh, will be given, oh, will be given by this special value of Kapranov's data function, where again, you see that it's gonna, uh, yeah, it's gonna, well, it's gonna depend on uh, the product mn, but if I fix x and I vary m and n by keeping m and n uh, constant, and uh, this is gonna, it's gonna always be the same limit. And so using this, well, for k equals c and phi, the Hodge-Dillon measure, which uh, happens to be, uh, uh, ha happens to satisfy weak rationality for any x, uh, we recover Farb uh, Wilson Wood, the result from before. If k is a finite field and phi is the data measure, we get the Heidemar convergence. Uh, so this is, uh, so in particular, uh, we, like our uh, dream conjecture is, is sort of uh, true in this case, but it's, we're kind of cheating here because we're deducing it from, uh, from the motivic lift. So yeah, but, but still, uh, we're, it's, it's one place where we actually can prove Heidemar convergence. And I also want to say that we actually have a result for like more general uh, uh, spaces where we don't just uh, like uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, X from having like multiplicity at least N everywhere, but also um, we can have like several, several conditions on the multiplicity vector. Like the multiplicity vector should not be larger than uh, a bunch of uh, vector, a bunch of vectors in some finite set. But I don't have to, uh, time to go into that. But in particular, we can uh, like do spaces like this, where uh, we have like two configuration spaces, and we want the, want uh, pairs that are disjoint. Okay. And if I if I can have one minute, I can just uh, give you the well, two minutes. <laughs> I can give you the the proof because it's very short. Yeah. So the proof is just a generating function proof. So I consider the generating function of of the spaces X and D, and also the corresponding generating function for the spaces sim D, which is, it's, it's very easy, it just factorizes into product of the Kapranov data functions of the different TI, uh, of the different variables TI. And the key observation is that these two generating functions are actually very related in a very simple way um, by this formula. So the, there's just this extra Kapranov data function at uh, evaluate at the product of variables uh, to the n uh, that appears. And this is just a geometric, a simple geometric argument. It's just that whenever I have a tuple of, uh, of zero cycles, I can just uh, kind of take all of the points that have multiplicity at least n in all uh, coordinates. I put them all in some zero cycle that will have some degree l. So I put it here. And then the rest uh, is going to be a, a zero cycle in this uh, um, like a, a tuple of zero cycle in this space. And so this map by this, what I just said, uh, so we can check easily that it's a bijection on geometric points. And so it's radial subjective. And so uh, these two things have the same um, class in the group in the green varieties. And this proves that this thing times this thing is this thing. And so now if we go back to the proof, uh, the the idea is that if I put R to be equal to the dimension of X, then how do I recover X and D? Well, renormalize by some power of L, but that's not a big deal. How do I recover it? Well, the, the idea is that I'm going to take its generating function and I'm going to multiply it by the following factors. I just have one factor for each uh, for each variable times the generating function, and then I just truncate the whole thing at the multi degree d. So I just keep I just keep the all the terms of multi degree uh, multi degree uh, smaller than at, at most d, and then I evaluate the whole thing at t one equal t m dot 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 equal L to the minus R. 
Okay, so to, to this is just a general thing that if I want to recover the uh, the d coefficient of some uh, some power series, I have to I can just do this algebraic manipulation and I get it. And so if I do the same with the generating function of sim d, then I will get this divided by the same thing, but for uh, for uh, sim d. And if I let d go to infinity, I don't have it. I'm not truncating anything anymore. And these factors all uh, just uh, just uh, cancel out. And so I can show that the limit is going to be just g n divided by the generating function of these guys, which is this product of Kapranov data functions, evaluated again at all the ti's equal uh, equal l to the minus r. And this, by the equality that we proved on the previous slide, is exactly uh, the limit that we're looking for in, um, in the theorem. Yeah, so I guess that's all. I, I'm sorry that was a little bit quick, but the, the proof is, is really that, that, that that's all there is to this proof. So I just wanted to say it. And so, yeah, thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Margaret, uh, for a great talk. So uh, if you feel comfortable, you can unmute yourself in the back now.